She's here. Who's here? She's here. Doris, Doris dear. It's Doris with a cocktail in She's the perfect husband. I'm the best friend. I'm the best friend. Yeah, maybe. Hi, dears. Welcome back to Doris Dears Girl Talk. Still polishing up our Silver Telly Award that we won for season one of the series. Oh, my goodness. My hands hurt from all that polishing. I'm your hostess, Doris Dear, otherwise known as America's Perfect Housewife. It's good to have you back in the rumpus room. Now, we're reading from Arlene Dahl's Marvy book entitled Arlene Dahl's Love Scopes, written in 1983. It's chock-a-block full of great ideas based on your zodiac sign and how to keep your lover happy. Or, as I like to say, how Miss Dahl manipulates everyone she's in love with. Well, after all, she was married for six times. <laughs> now, look, I don't know Miss Arlene Dahl, but in her own words has had a versatile career in acting, beauty, fashion, and astrology. She started 28 motion pictures, 17 stage plays and musicals, and has written 16 best-selling books. Let me tell you, she was truly a power player, and that is no small feat for a woman during that time. Good for you, Arlene. Now, on the flap of the book, she gives advice on fulfilling fantasies and how to fill each other. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, fulfill each other. <laughs> Or maybe both. Mm. So sit back, relax, and it's time for some psychic magic from this season's author, Arlene Dahl, and her book, Love Stories. <laughs> okay, now to the book. Today's guest is an Aquarius. So you know what? Let's see what Miss Dahl has to suggest. Aquarius, the far out star. It was the 80s. <laughs> Aquarius the water bearer is the most exciting, original, and altruistic sign in the zodiac. To this air sign, making love is as natural as breathing. And speaking of air, you do like to talk a bit. Oh, wait till you meet our guest. <laughs> you have a progressive and perceptive mind. Well, ruled by the electrical planet Uranus. No, no, it's too easy. Hmm. Aquarians make the most fascinating lovers, like famous politicians, like Ronald Reagan. Oh, oh, Ronald and Nancy, exciting. I don't know, I don't know. Let's see. Hmm. Oh, the Aquarius man. The adventurous Aquarian man makes powerful waves which could charge your batteries fast <laughs> or wear them out, <laughs> so they say. <laughs> Get involved with his projects. Take a tip from First Lady Nancy Reagan. You've seen that picture of Nancy on the lap of Mr. T, right? Yeah, okay. Well, now how to give your Aquarian man that Saturday night fever? Oh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Turn him on by wearing his favorite colors. Okay. Mm. Give him lots of freedom and a night out with the boys. Mm. Careful what you ask for. Mm. He goes for the newest electronic gadgets. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, be flexible. <laughs> I'm known to kick up my heels. Mm. Well, that's our tips from Arlene Dahl and Love Scopes. <laughs> Thanks, Arlene. Love you. Well, that's our Aquarius reading today. Thank you, Arlene, and your love scopes. Well, I think you get the idea. Oh, it's full of great stuff, isn't it? Remember, each show I'll be sharing some simply wonderful nuggets from this fab book. So mix up a great cocktail. Sit back, get comfy in the rumpus room, and get your Zodiac on with Arlene Dahl and Doris Deer. Now tune in each week for a little bit of fun. And don't forget, you can find all these stories on my website at dorisdeer.com forward slash girl, G-U-R-L, 
hyphen talk. <gasps> oh, who could that be? Doris, Doris dear, they told me I'd find you here and so I have. Jack Vertel. <laughs> Welcome to Doris Deer's Rumpus Room. I've always wanted to visit the Rumpus Room. Yes. I've never had the chance. <laughs> well, I there's guess one has to be invited, I suppose. One must only be invited. All right, yes. fine. And as they said in I Love Lucy, it's the Rumpus Room because when you have a rumpus, you have to go to the room. Oh, that's what well, they said. I'm glad they'd be here. We'll see what happens next. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Now, I have to say, each, each season, this is season three of our award winning. Telly Award. Telly Award. I I'm love gonna, that little person. I know. It's Whatever almost kind of like a Rolls Royce. Yes, yes. 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 It's almost like a Rolls Royce. Uh, we start off, I, I read from books, a book that I choose, and this season we are saluting the Zodiac through Arlene Doll's Love oh, well. Scopes. <laughs> it's how to find love through the Zodiac. I, I don't know. It was an idea. We'll see if it works. <laughs> anyway, you are an Aquarius. I am. Yes, and it, she says that you're exciting, original, and altruistic. I would say that that does describe you. I wouldn't dare say that that would describe me, but if you want to say it, that's fine. <laughs> I say I it. I will take the compliment. Yes, and... Uh, I'm sure there's some negative things as well, which you're not going to bring out. But. No, well, I'm going to read them when you're not here okay, to perfect. the camera, yes. And, of course, I make a drink that sort of puts... Exciting, original, and altruistic into the drink. And so we have now, you just, you know how to say this better than me. It's a caipirinha. I recognize it. A caipirinha. Anyway. It's a Cuban drink. Yes. So cheers. cheers. Because I think it says Jack. And an excellent caipirinha it is. Okay. I'll drink that. Day drinking. Well, it's, I mean, it's happy hour somewhere. Yeah. It's always 420 someplace. Okay. So. Um, you have quite a long history of theater. So we were just talking before the cameras were rolling that it started with your grandfather was... Could help My, my grandfather was a builder. A builder. His name was Jack Shapiro. Uh, and he built ma many theaters across the country, but on Broadway, the Hellinger, the Mark Hellinger, which is now a church, of course, <sighs> alas. But My Fair Lady played there, and yeah. many wonderful shows played there. And also, the last show to play there had Peter Allen in it. It was uh, Legs Diamond. Was Legs, oh, Legs Diamond. Yes. That was the show that closed the Hellinger. Legs Di That'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do it. Wow. And then your father, he wrote, My right? father wrote a play, which was produced on Broadway at what is now the Richard Rogers. It was then the 46th Street Theater. It ran two weeks, and he decided to go into business with his father in the building business. <laughs> and what was the name of that play? The name of that play was So Proudly We Hail. So Proudly We Hail. It's a good title. It's a play about military school. It was an anti-military school play, which, you know, even today is an interesting topic. It's an interesting topic, but back then, well, what year was that? That was... 1937. Probably not a good time to be anti-military. Well, we were building up to World War II. Yeah. yeah. Tough time to be yeah. writing a play about that. Huh. Now, that's an interesting thing. You said it closed in two weeks. Yeah. Now, we're both involved in, in commercial theater. You way more than me. I'm just trying to earn my rent, honey. In any, in anything yeah. I'm involved. A wealth. Yeah. You heard it. You heard it here. I'm holding them to it. I just need to pay my rent. But, uh, you know, what can I say? Uh, but, you know, it's back in the back in the day, they would open a show. If it didn't go well, they closed it, took whatever was money left, gave it... Sprinkled yep. it around and moved on. Yep. No big deal. These days, it seems that they run them until they are in the ground. Why do you think that shift? I mean, for me, look, I always say there's no failure. Like you learn. If you're a playwright, something doesn't work. You move on and you write another play, or you go into into the, <laughs> the building the building business. But I mean, like, what? Why that shift? And when do you think that shift might have happened? I think. Uh, I mean, it's completely speculative. I think the main thing that happened was. The, was the vast increase in marketing possibilities. It, it, you know, back in the days of So Proudly We Hail, you took an ad in each of the newspapers, there were probably 15 of them back in those days, you opened the box office, you put up a sign that said box office now open, and if nobody came, you closed the show. Now, you can convince yourself that there's a million ways to sell the show. Right. And to some degree, there are. Shows that don't make any money and run for a long time anyway aren't 
playing to no audience. They're playing to some audience. So right, they're people, just losing money. Right, because so people not are enough. able to convince themselves, oh, it's going to catch on. It just needs to find its audience. Wait till Christmas. Wait till the awards. Wait till you know. Um, and so there's this. I mean, when I was a kid going to the theater for the first time in 1962. There must have been ten shows that year that closed in one performance. They opened, they got right. terrible reviews, <laughs> and the next day they called up the cast and said, "Don't come in tonight." I mean, and it wasn't uncommon. You just, you're right. You just moved on. You moved on to the next day. Well, Karen Mason was a guest in season one, and she told the story. Her first Broadway show, it was a country show. Opening night, they went out for their party on one of those New York ferry things. And as they got off, they got their pink slip yeah, and a belt buckle. <laughs> and that was in. it. Don't show up tomorrow. Don't We're done. In. We're done. <laughs> We're closed. Okay, so you have been uh, senior vice president of Jujams and Theaters for a number of years. Yes. You came in with, with Rocco. Right, Rocco Landersman. Rocco Landersman. And one of the great things that you did, and thank God for anyone who loves theater, is that you really were shepherding uh, August Wilson. Yeah, we we made an early decision at Drew Jamson. In fact, a couple of days after I came to work, we were interviewed by, I think, it was, I don't remember who, it was whoever the New York Times feature writer back then was. I think it was Jeremy Gerard. Um, and one of the things we said was, we're going to do American work. And it was both a practical and uh, commitment situation. It was practical because... The Schubert's and the Nederlanders had ongoing relationships with Cameron McIntosh and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Peter Schaffer and Tom Stoppard. And so we couldn't get our hands on any of that work, even if we wanted to. Right. But it also meant that they were so focused on that that there were lots of American writers, directors, actors in some cases, who just weren't being recognized on Broadway. And August had said he would write 10 plays, one in each decade. And having agreed to produce the first one, which I brought with me, when I got to your jams, I brought it across the country in my suitcase. We agreed to do them all. We said, you know what, we'll do them all. Wow. You know, because it's a way of saying we support this and we support, and we were not only committed to a lot of American work, we were committed to a, a, a lot of non-white work. We agreed to do, we did three of David Henry Huang's plays, we did August's plays, and we did um, also the first musical. There's another musical that claims this, but that we were the earliest musical, I believe, Produced, directed, conceived, written entirely by women. Check, 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 check. And what was that? The Secret Garden. Ah, The Secret Garden. Wow. So, which did now, not get good reviews, but has survived to become a perennial. So let's take it back. You were on the West Coast as a very young man. Very young. And you, where, how did, so how did your theater involvement start? You started as a critic, right? So uh, my you, first job was as a critic, yes. Yeah. I, I thought I would go on to the West Coast to become a screenwriter, but I had two strikes against me. The first one was that I didn't know anything about screenwriting or how to write one, okay. screenplay, which, you know, is a drawback. And the second one was I had no skill at selling myself. And one of the things I learned out there was that the people who got ahead in the movies were people who would march into anyone's office and say, you need me more than I need you, and I just couldn't do that. I couldn't uh, do it. Yeah. It's hard. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. I mean, it's called pitching. Yeah. And that is... <sighs> well, I learned the lesson in a funny way, actually, which is that I had to do... I, I then became like a freelance magazine writer, and one of the things I did was I interviewed Robert Zemeckis, who had not yet made Back to the Future, but he had made a uh -huh. couple of independent movies. And I asked him how he got started, and he said, here's how I got started. I didn't have any money, really. I went into a film supply store, and I bought two of those big cans that hold 35 millimeter... Yeah. There was nothing in them. I couldn't afford to buy reels or anything. And I would go to every, uh, you know, gate, the Paramount gate, the Universal gate, and I would say, I have these for Mr. Coppola. I have these for Mr. Scorsese. And they would lift the thing, and I would walk onto the lot, and then I'd just walk around from, you know, room to room saying, does anybody need an assistant? Does anybody? So that's how I got started. And when I heard that story, I thought, I am never going to make it in this business. Because I couldn't do that if you paid me. Wow. That's, a, that's fantastic. Well, it's so funny you mentioned Back to the Future, which is now... A musical. A musical opening in London. It just opened, yeah. It just opened. Mm -hmm. Well, they... Yeah, they had a little COVID mm -hmm. scare. Uh, what's his, the lead? Uh, he got COVID and had to step out. His, his right. understudy had to go on, but it's opened. And 
may be coming to Broadway. It's supposed to come to Broadway, yeah. but you know. according to press, according to press, yeah. it's always coming to Broadway. Everything is. I have an idea, and it's we're writing it. It's coming to Broadway. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like every press release. Um, now. You conceived the long-running hit, Smokey Joe's Cafe. I did. So tell me about that. What? Look, we live in a very different world, as we both know. We do now, I, I let's be upfront. Jack and I are very good friends. I feel we're, we're kind of besties. Yeah. Would you say that? Yeah. Well, we're besties. <laughs> and so we have I take had... Take Taurus dancing. I mean, let's be... Let's yeah, I mean, come on. Uh, but we have had many discussions about theater over a couple of cocktails. So... We live in a different world. It's a world where uh, people of color are being more recognized. And as you said, working with uh, at Jude Jamson, you really shepherded in women, people of color. It's very important. Unfortunately, not everybody else did that. But what made you conceive? I think, it, let me say, I think today it would be hard for a white cis man to conceive a black musical. Because there would be a lot, I think they could, but there would be a lot thrown out him. Absolutely. So, back, take us back, because it's a different time. So take us back, because it's a great show, was successful. Tell me what, what made you want to do that. Well, first of all, there was no prohibition to my doing something like that. I mean, this was a different world. There maybe should have been, but there wasn't. Um, and, of course, the show features the songs of Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, two white Jewish cis men. Yes. Um, who were very much alive and with us, and um, but had spent a great deal of their career, not all of it, writing for black talent. Um, and uh, I, I, it, the conception was very simple. I was a big Lieber and Stoller fan, and had been since I was a little boy. The, fir the very first record I ever made my parents buy me was uh, the, char the char Charms, I think, doing black denim trousers and motorcycle boots, which is a Lieber and Stoller song. I ah. don't think I was more than five or six years old when <laughs> I heard it on the radio in a car, and I made my parents stop at a record store and buy it. It was a 78 RPM ah. record on Capitol. So every funny song that I heard from then for many, many years always was a Lieber and Stoller song. Uh, they wrote for the Coasters, they wrote for the Drifters, they wrote for lot, you know, a lot of these uh, uh, bands. And um, and they were sort of like vaudeville acts in a way. So I had always loved them. And I went to a performance of Amos Behave in some place. I think it was in Los Angeles. And on the way, driving home, I thought, you know, I wonder if you could do this with Lieber and Stoller. Because Amos Behave is the best. Oh, so Smokey good. Joe's Cafe, notwithstanding Amos Behave is still the best of those reviews. It's an amazing review. A totally amazing achievement. With that opening cast was right. just magic. So, yeah, great. So I just set out to see whether it was possible. And the way I did it was I took Eight Misbehaving song by song. I put the name of the song on a file card and I went one, two, three, four, five. That's act one. And I did, got another bulletin board and did that's act two. <laughs> and then I put blank cards next to each of the cards. And I thought, okay, so Lieber and Stoller songs. What, what, why is the order of Eight Misbehaving the way it is? And how could I ape that and absolutely steal it as completely as possible because I knew that with a different set of songs and with a sort of a conception that's not a plot so that you're on a journey from the beginning to the end but the audience doesn't really know that they're on the journey they're right. just on it which is the brilliant thing about Amos Behaving that the entire show leads to black and blue and you, you don't know it until you hit it right what could I do so I just lifted it okay I lifted it as best I could I lifted it that's brilliant how do you get to stand by me? Well, okay, that's the question. <laughs> so you're out in L.A., you're freelancing, you're doing all this work, and you get a call from Rocco because you wrote a bad review. Right. I, I was no longer freelancing when I got the call. I had, I had been a critic for seven years, and then I went to work for the Mark Taper Forum, which is the big not-for-profit theater out there. Um, but yes, I wrote a very bad review of the tryout of Big River. Um, which was tried out at the, at the La Jolla Playhouse. And I wrote this review for the Herald Examiner, a, a newspaper that no longer exists, like so many other newspapers. <laughs> like so many others. I take no responsibility for its <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, And he called me out of the blue. He had just taken over Drew he had just It had just been announced that day that he had taken over Drew Champs, and I'm sure that the paperwork was all yeah. done long before that invited me to come work in New York. I said, why? He said, well, you wrote this terrible review of Big River, 
and I used it to help them fix the show <laughs> because it was a smart, bad review. He said, you did beat up on my wife, a set designer, and you're not going to be forgiven for that. But, <laughs> but Rocco was a very, you know, uh, uh, daring kind of guy. He, did, he, he listened when people said things were bad around him because he figured if people are saying it's bad, I'd better see if I can you should it listen, better. Or at least say, I don't agree with you that it's bad, but I can right. listen. But you should hear it. So yeah. he did, and he hired me. And wow. I came. Wow. And that, what year was that? 1987, September of 87. Wow. Well, it's, I mean, it, it's always been told to me, if you want to actually get the, the real feeling for how a show's going, go to the bathroom, go to the men's room, go to the ladies' room and yep. stand there and listen. Absolutely. Because everybody is always talking. <laughs> that was one trick. <laughs> the other one that I learned by myself, basically, just figured it out, was if you go during previews and sit in a box and look at the audience. Don't look at the show, watch the audience. You can see them getting engaged and getting disengaged. And then when they start to leave through their program, you know that's when you're really in trouble. Well, that's so interesting because Charles Bush, we interviewed, and he said that he, it was Tale of the Ologist's wife. Yeah. It was opening night previews and they didn't have a seat for him. <laughs> and they stuck him up in one of those in box, box yeah. up in the front that has a partial view. Yeah. He couldn't see the stage, so he watched the audience the entire time. And he said it was, the, it was this bizarre sort of surreal thing for him that he's on Broadway, his work is being done, but then he would see the people laugh, yeah. he would see the people disengage and then engage back. And he, it was like an, uh, it's funny that you, you say You can take that notes from that and yeah, you can say, you know what? If you're open to yeah. it. Yeah, well, you have to be. You have to be open to it. So then you come to, uh, oh. so I have a quote. When I was six, my grandmother and my parents took me to see Mary Martin and Peter Pan. I saw this audience and more than 1,000 people, including me, have this sudden outbreak of unfettered joy. I wanted to have that experience again and again and also help create it in any way I could. That's a fair, that's a, if I said that, I'll stand by it. <laughs> well, it's on Wikipedia. Yeah, okay. Or Google, one of them. And you know, this, they, they don't lie. They don't lie on the internet. I mean, jeez. But I love that. 1954, I mean, yeah. come on. Mary Martin and Peter Pan. My first show at the Winter Garden. And when, the, the, when I went to the Tony Awards this year, there I was back at the Winter Garden. Ah. And... In a funny way, the best moment for me was when Cheetah Rivera stood there and said, you know, this is the 64th anniversary of my standing on this stage on opening night of West Side Story and playing wow. Anita. And I thought, boy, I mean, the first thing I thought of other than, I mean, I remember seeing that performance when I was a little older, uh, was, yeah, and two years before that, I was sitting in row double A with my grandmother watching Peter Pan in this building. It's a magical building. I mean, for us, it's a magical building. Uh, I went right home and promised all my friends that when I had my birthday party, I would make them fly. I did. An early mistake in my life. But haven't you been making people fly ever since? This well, no. I, 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 I do think that I, my career, to whatever degree I've had one, has been an attempt to make people fly, both emotionally in the audience and also technically on the stage. Not necessarily fly, but do things that are magical. But to escape. I mean, yeah. when I go to the theater, I just want to... I want to escape. I don't want yeah. to think about what's out there. I just want to escape and fly with whatever's happening right. in front of me. But you me. can fly in a. You can fly at death of a salesman. You know. Oh, you can, absolutely. I mean, or, you know, or, or or one of all the piano lesson or, or fences. I mean, you you, you you what makes you fly is not that it's escapist. It's that no. you escape into another that world. That you escape to it, whatever it, world. It, that yes, is and whatever you. world that is, you participate in the ups and downs and highs and lows and. And boy, isn't that magical when it it's, happens. It, it's amazing. Yeah. And then you come out at the, on the other side and you've lived someplace else. Yeah. It's truly magical. I mean, yeah. I, and when it doesn't happen is when I... Yeah. You have to be you patient. Know. You have to say, yeah. you know what, not tonight, maybe tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh well. The hardest I, part is when you know it can happen with that vehicle, but it's not happening yet in early previews of a show that's going to end up working but isn't working yet, that is So let's painful. talk about that. First, I think I should, we should have a little cocktail. All right, we'll have a little, little sip, sip because why not? It's, <laughs> cheers. Mm. Speaking to that, let's talk about Hairspray. You've told okay. many a story. I've seen you on a Zoom. He's been on a Zoom a few times about Hairspray. All right. um, talk about Hairspray. I mean, you always tell the story how your idea 
Thank God they never did it. But really, talk about hairspray. <laughs> now, you were you were a dramaturg? Yeah, I mean, I think I was a creative consultant. I was a dramaturg, but in, yeah. in a, I think my contract said creative consultant. So just wait, just so our audience knows. A dramaturg. Explain a dramaturg. Well, a dramaturg can mean a million different things depending on where you are. But what it meant for me was consulting with the authors, the director, and the producer to try to fill the gaps, make things better, sometimes make things briefer, sometimes make things clearer. Um, because you need an outside, I don't need, but it, I think it's helpful to have an outside eye and ear listening to the audience saying, I think they're confused about this um, or they don't really like this for some reason. Can we make it, can we make them like it or does it need to go or whatever? You know, you're a consultant. You know? And that's an easy set of water to swim through <laughs> because we worked on something together down in Alabama, right. where the writers didn't especially take kindly to any... They did not. No. So those are, those are tough artistic waters to kind of... You know, through. when they don't, it's either because they're not gonna, or it's because you're presenting it in a way that is hard to hear, or the, sometimes it's the, it's the dramaturg's responsibility to find a way in, find a way to make the artists believe that you're on their side, that they, that they trust you, that you're seeing the same show in your head that they're seeing in their head. It's not always the authors who are the problem. Right. Um, but when but there's, then first when there's time, an unbridgeable problem, it's unbridgeable. Right, and then also young first-time writers don't understand right. that this is a normal process, right. of the developmental process, right. which can take 7, 10, 12 years, right. whatever it takes, it takes, right? Yeah. So let's get back to Hairspray. Let's talk about Hairspray. Talk to me about... You were involved in that quite a lot. And yeah. Uh, Margot Lyon, the producer, may she rest in peace, she died earlier this year, or possibly in the last year, um, brought me in as a consultant early on. I mean, Hairspray was written initially by uh, Mark Shaman and, and Scott Whitman wrote the score, and they were very experienced theater fans and types and whatever. They'd never written a Broadway score before. Mark had written a lot of movie music, and, mm -hmm. but they, they pretty much knew what they were doing. Um, and Mark O'Donnell, who was the book writer, was a, essentially a sketch writer for Saturday Night Live, and he'd come from the Harvard Lampoon, I think, and the National mm -hmm. Lampoon. And he didn't really have much experience in telling a long-form story from beginning to end. So that became kind of my mission, um, was to figure out how to help tell this story. And eventually they brought in a second book writer, um, Tom Meehan, who is it was even more experienced at, at that kind of structural thinking than I was, um, but that was the that was the challenge with that show. On the other hand, that show was a hit from the first reading of the first act. I mean, unlike it's only happened to me twice, three times, um, and the third one I didn't really have much to do with, which was Book of Mormon. But I went to a reading, a, a workshop of it, and thought this show is finished. I mean, can't miss. Yeah. Um, it happened with the producers, and it happened with Hairspray. Okay, um, so. Three of, like, the biggest hits on Broadway. Yeah, three times and a hundred times, you know, yeah. 200 times. Um, but the, pro the, the, the challenge for Hairspray was that Mark O'Donnell and the songwriters were so interested in and, and focused on the politics of the piece, which were very forward-thinking for their time, mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the voice of the piece, which was, you know, extremely eccentric, mm -hmm that they had sort of forgotten that there's a romance at the center of the piece that has to be oh, written at the yeah. same time. So they had written a show that had these gaps in it. You never really knew what Tracy thought about Link Larkin. You never knew why they, they never really broke up. They never really came back together. They never really did. They were left out of their own story in a sense. They, you know, they were very focused on Harvey Firestein and Edna and all of that. So that the challenge there was to say, okay, we, how do we... How do we manage to thread the actual story of this romance through this very multifarious plot that right. involves so many people? And it was a lot of fun. Yeah. It's a lot of fun to do. Great show. But you know, the funny thing about that kind of dramaturgy, what is very rewarding about it, and at the same time you go harumph, is you make a suggestion or you ask a question, and the and the authors go away and they do something that has nothing to do with what you suggested. <laughs> that totally solves the problem anyway. Right. So we had this conversation about, you know, where where does Tracy, what does Tracy think about Link Larkin and how can we kind of amplify that into a scene that they, they meet and they talk and they whatever. 
So Mark and Scott went away and wrote I Can Hear the Bells, which is a total fantasy <laughs> sequence yeah. about what she thinks about right. Nick Larkin. And then it, it's actually staged as a wedding, but it's all inside her head. Right. And I, and I thought, damn it, you solved this problem without <laughs> paying the slightest attention to any of the suggestions <laughs> that I made. And then I thought, good for you. You're the writers. <laughs> I'm the dramaturg. <laughs> Now talk to me, because there are moments, and we have talked about this in the past uh, as friends, uh, there are moments in Broadway history that shift Broadway in a different direction. There are shows like Chorus Line, Hamilton, I suppose. Um, what is, what's your list? What are the shows that you think you've, that you've lived through and you, you, I mean, first of all, okay, we might as well talk about this right now. You wrote the book. I wrote a book. You, yeah, this, well, it's the book. I mean, right, this is right. the secret life of the American musical. Okay, read it because it's fantastic. New York Times bestseller. It's fun to write. It was, and I tried to make it something that would be fun to read. Well, it's fun to read because it's not like oh, I'm sitting in a classroom. It's yeah. really fun. And the fact that you like the overture to Wildcat, starring my my love Lucille Ball, <laughs> <laughs> that it has a great overture because of the horns. Well. It Come does. on. Those poor trumpet players. Those I can't imagine. Poor they trumpet lasted. players. I don't think any of them could play eight performances a week. There must have been a sub in there every night. I mean, I but let's do a little side note. Wildcat came out in I don't know, the sixty, I think. Something yeah. like that. How many back then how big was an orchestra? Probably like, twenty eight. Twenty eight, and how big is an orchestra now? Probably fourteen or fifteen. Yeah. It's a big difference. Yeah. It's and one of the sound. reasons that one of the reasons that there are no overtures or very few overtures today is Right. They, they miss they the overture. Like much, you know. But that's why we have encores, which we'll talk to later. Yeah. But talk to me about that. Those those shows, for you, what are those shows that you either saw or researched about that you said, this is this, this is different. Suddenly Broadway flipped. It well, changed. Well, leaving aside the first real change, I think, or I'm not going to leave it aside because here I am talking about, when operettas changed into kind of urban satirical musicals. You know, when Sigmund Romberg and The New Moon became George Gershwin and Lady Be Good. Mm -hmm. um, but that was so long ago. Mm -hmm. There's nobody alive who remembers it happening. <laughs> well, we do. We're the sitting first, here. <laughs> the, first one re the first one really was Oklahoma. I mean, that's a cliche. Yeah. Well, the first, first one was Showboat. But Showboat, which was sort of half operetta and half very experimental and forward-looking and radical, it didn't have, it didn't leave a wake. No, nobody else tried to do that again for 20 years. I right. Mean, um, so uh, Oklahoma was the was the switch over in terms of the fact that now everybody wanted to have an Oklahoma. Right. You know, um, because it integrated story and song. It had full body characters, more or less, for a musical. It had elements of operetta in it still. I mean, Ado Annie and Will Parker are not exactly you know Stephen Sondheim, but right. But, but, they were the beginning of a really modern way of telling a story with music, dance, and words, um, and scenery. Um, so that was a big, big changeover. And I think the next really big changeover was probably West Side Story. And one thanks God, that's a huge gap. It's not a huge gap. Oklahoma was 1943, West Side Story was 1957. It's like, yeah. you like go that. back 15 years from now and see how, see how well you remember, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but West Side Story really changed the landscape. And then, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm missing things, but then I think probably the Sondheim era that came after, the, the, the quick succession of company follies and a little night music really changed the era. Now, in between, there was the whole British invasion in the 80s. There was Cats and Phantom, which, whatever one may think of them, are changed, they changed things in terms of the spectacularness of what you could put on stage. Yes, And that has sure. lasted and been amplified in things like The Lion King and, you know, on and on. By the way, I was just on a cruise ship that had cats. Oh, well, there you go. Um, you know, so there, there was that, and then there was this Sondheim era, which was, it came before it, which was in the 70s. And then at the end of, at, sort of at the end of the 80s, when Lloyd Webber had had a few very big hits, and Cameron McIntosh had had a few very big hits, The Les Mis, and all of that. Um, there came sort of the the beginning of the era that we think of as being our the era we're in now. And I left out a chorus line, of course, in the mid '70s, which was in the Sondheim it was in that same decade, but it was very revolutionary in terms of how it told a story, how it presented itself. Um, I was a little college boy 
discovering theater for the first time and I came home yeah. to Staten Island and saw that and was like, you mean us chorus types can be stars of a show? Yeah. Like it just blew my mind. Yeah. Because that never was. Well, those are the shows that blow people's minds. I yeah. think, you know, I'm sure I've left out a few. But Yeah. I mean, uh, I think when I went to see Hamilton, I was in Hamilton for the opening and it, you know, could say what you want, but it was like, okay, the historic musical has changed forever. Yeah. Like, no. we don't want... I mean, Lee Miz has its place and all that, but that's not what we want. Right. This changes everything. But I think Hamilton, which is definitely one of those shows, in a way, is like Showboat. I don't think it's going to leave a wake of right. 20, you know, hip-hop musicals. No. It's just going to change... It's much more going to change things from a diversity and equity point of view than it is from a stylistic point of view. Right. Um, you, you don't... You don't necessarily need those musical elements unless you need them, unless you want to do that kind of show. But I yeah. think it has forever changed how we look at who can be in a show, who can't, you know, anybody can be in a show. How do you tell a story? Can you tell a story with people who are nothing at all like the characters they're playing from a physical point of view? I yeah. mean, it's re totally revolutionary in that way. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have to say, Chris Jackson, you know, if you need anyone to make a flag, here I am. Okay. Betsy Ross right over here. <laughs> Just saying. Now let's talk, since we're on Hamilton, let's talk a little bit about what's going on now with streaming. Obviously, Hamilton, they spent an enormous amount of money because the show made an enormous amount of money. Um, commercial theater is about money, right? right? Commercial, I think some people get upset talking about money and, and broad, Broadway is commercial theater. It's not nonprofit. It's commercial theater. If it doesn't make a profit, it eventually will close because right. you just can't pay the bills. Hamilton is a huge success. They make a profit. They spend a huge amount of money filming it over several days. They put it on a streaming service. It's a huge hit, although it did open up conversations about the show itself, which people probably had not really discussed before, but putting a camera close up to people of color playing slave owners and not really dealing with... I mean, there was a conversation, a cost of conversation. Right. But what's your thoughts on that? I mean, now it seems like there are there is the call to every show should be taped and shown on streaming. I mean, there's a lot of opinions. Some people say, yes, it increases the audience. Other people will say, if it's shown on HBO+, Plus, why would I pay $200 or more for a ticket to see on Broadway? What's your thoughts on well, that? Well, I, I would, I mean, my thoughts are not very profound about it. I think for many years, the whole time that I was growing up in professional theater, there were contracts that said you could not make a movie of this right. musical until so many months or years had passed since it closed because to make a movie would be to cannibalize the audience. Finally, someone made a movie of a show that was still running and it did not anything but cannibalize the audience. It blew up the audience. The right. audience started to come in droves because they had seen the movie, now they wanted to see the show. Right. So I've a, I'm of a mind at the moment that you know, this is promotion. This is not cannibalization. It actually helps the show. It doesn't hurt the show. But, you know, as soon as they stream one of these things and the box office dries up instantaneously, you'll have to go back to thinking about it the other way. But that right. hasn't happened. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a difficult decision. I mean, there's recently been some Broadway shows turned into full-fledged movies that have not done well. Right. There's one out right now not doing well, and you wonder... I mean, look. To you, some degree, that's a question of: Is it a movie people want to see? Is it a movie that people consider right? A good movie and there's about? also a difference between a movie version of a musical and a, and a, and a musical yes, film. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, they're two very. Because when you elements. stream a Broadway show, you're not doing an adaptation of the material; you're doing right. the material. Yeah. When you make a movie, you're making all kinds of other choices that are either help or don't help tell the story, and the casting is the casting, and you know it's better or it's not as good. Right. Streaming is a direct line. Mm -hmm. And I, I recently watched a Broadway show that was on streaming and actually kind of enjoyed it. And in fact, I, I it was a show I wasn't a huge fan of, and I kind of oh, I like it. Yeah, I kind of it kind of gave me a better appreciation of the show itself and especially the mm -hmm. actors. So it can be a it can be a two sided yeah. thing. And the encore's production, the, one of the plot points in the show, which is based on history, um, is that the slave in it has shipped himself in a box from the South. That's how he's escaped slavery. Mm. And arrives where the suffragettes are, have, a, have a house on the Underground Railroad, basically. 
and he gets out of the box and then he eventually sings this song, The Eagle and Me. What we didn't know was that we cast an actor, a wonderful, wonderful voice, um, who we had to bring in from Los Angeles to play this part, who had claustrophobia. <laughs> So he didn't Wait, want to go uh, in the box. You can't write this. He stuff, did not want to go in the box. <laughs> <laughs> I love these interviews that went on so long that we had to do a two-parter. Aren't we fancy? <laughs> season three. <laughs> Telly Award from season one. Fingers crossed for season two. Mm. I love when friends drop by and we share some fun ideas and bring some joy to the world around us. Now don't forget, please head over to www.dorisdeer.com forward slash girl, G-U-R-L hyphen talk for all of the information from today's show. And I hope you'll drop by the Rumpus Room again for more Doris Deer's Girl Talk. Thanks, Blake. It's a winner. Stay safe and hugs and love from Doris Deer. Remember, a dress doesn't get you anywhere. It's the life you live in the dress that matters. See you soon. Cheers. <laughs> it's Doris. It's Doris Deer. She's in her She'll show up with a sweet killer door when she knocks on your door. Hi everybody, Doris Deer here, America's Perfect Housewife. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for sticking by myself and all of my artist friends over the past year and a half. It's a new normal, but the arts are coming back. That's right, and we're gonna come back strong. And I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, and thank you from the bottom of my Doris Deer heart. Please remember, a dress doesn't get you anywhere. It's the life you live in the dress that matters. <laughs>